Yeah, thank you. Manuel, how are you? Do I pronounce I'm your good, name I'm correctly? Good. Yes, 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 Professor. Okay, thank you. Dr. Manuel, uh, he will talk today about uh, vertebral column anatomy, uh, sacrum and the coccyx, and the classification, yeah. uh, fracture classifications. Dr. Manuel is a spine surgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery, Krishna uh, Institute uh, in yes. India. Doctor, please uh, can go forward. Can you share your screen, please, Professor? Yes, please. Just a second. Yeah. yeah that's good. If you can Thank make you so it much. in full. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, the topic for that has been given to me is the anatomy of sacrum and coccyx and their fracture classification. Usually in our practice, we do not encounter uh, much of uh, sacrum and coccyx fracture. But nevertheless, I mean, we'll be talking mainly basically the theoretical aspect of the sacrum, coccyx and their fracture classification. Now, this is the overview. What I'll be talking about is embryology of the sacrum, anatomy of the sacrum, embryology of the coccyx, anatomy of the coccyx and the fracture classifications. Now, if we come... If we talk about the embryology, I mean, uh, the word, I mean, uh, before talking about the embryology, the word sacrum, it comes from a Greek word, uh, hirion osteon, which is, uh, which means uh, holy bone or the sacred bone. Uh, and uh, the sacrum, as we know, uh, the ossification centers, the primary ossification centers, there are mainly three, one for the center and the other for the two neural arches. Now, the first for the S1, S2 and S3, the ossification center appears around nine weeks. For the S4 and S5, it appears about 24 weeks. Now, during that time, around 24 to 34 weeks, there are other uh, centers, six centers, which appear for the sacral ali, as is shown in this picture. And the arrows are pointing towards the uh, ossification centers of the ali. Uh, there are also accessory and uh, uh, which are also called as secondary ossification centers for the upper and the lower end plates. And once these ossification centers appear, the sacrum usually starts fusing by the age of uh, adolescence, maybe 14 or 15. And then the complete fusion takes place uh, at the end of the third decade. Now coming to the anatomy of the sacrum, Sacrum, it's a very complex bone, which is an inverted triangle, and it's curved and tilted backwards, which it has four surfaces, the anterior, the posterior, and the two, uh, and the two lateral surfaces. The anterior surface is mainly concave and is smooth, and it has four ridges, as shown in this picture, which are the remnants of the intervertebral disc. On the lateral aspect of ear are the these neural foramen or the ventral foramen, which are broader than the uh, dorsal foramen for the exiting of the sacral nerve roots. And antero superior, as we see here, there's a prominence which is called as sacral promontory. Now, if we come to the posterior part of the sacrum, posterior part of the sacrum is very rough compared to the anterior. It has this, uh, it's a facet, a facet articular process. Then in the center uh, and just lateral to it, there are, the, there are uh, three crests. The median crest, which is formed by the spinous process of the sacrum. Then there is a interme intermediate crest, which is formed by the fusion of the articular process of the sacrum segments. And then there is a lateral crest, which is formed by the fusion of the transverse processes. Now, if we, take, if we look at the articulation, sacrum, base of the sacrum, base of the sacrum, it articulates with the L5 vertebra through the L5-S1 joint and the intervertebral disc base. While the apex, it articulates with the coccyx forming the sacrococcygeal joint. Posteriorly, the vertebral canal, it continues as the sacral canal, which ends as sacral hiatus at the level of S4. Now coming to the muscle attachments, now, this is the ventral surface or the anterior surface, which is smooth. 
the muscle if we take take a look at this picture there is a piriformis muscle which is attaching on the just lateral to the neural foramen and this piriformis again we know it attaches to the greater trochanter which is the external rotator of the hip then there is a few fibers of the iliacus which take which are attached or takes the, take the origin from the sacral ali and then there is a coccygeus muscle just distal to the piriformis muscle which is attached on the lateral surface of the sacrum and the coccyx now this is the posterior surface of the uh, of the sacrum now regarding the posterior surface muscle attachment here in the center just to the medial to the crest we have the multifidus which is a deeper muscle then just lateral to the multifidus there are superficial muscles the erector spinae muscles or the spinalis and then we have the gluteus maximus which is just in the caudal region of the sacrum or the posterior aspect dorsal aspect now the blood supply of the to the sacrum comes from the medial sacral arteries and veins medial sacral artery again is a branch from the straight from the abdominal aorta and the two lateral sacral artery these are the branches of the of the internal iliac artery the veins again they drain back to the internal iliac and the uh, common iliac regarding the lymph nodes uh, that are pre sacral lymph nodes again the which receive lymphatics from the rectum and the posterior pelvic wall what is the function of the sacrum when it comes to the function of the sacrum sacrum it acts like a support for the upper body and it helps in distribution of the weight across the axial and the appendicular skeleton clinical significance wise i mean there can be a metastasis from the pelvic organs then sacrum itself can be a primary site for the carcinoma and there are sacral stress fractures which are commonly seen in athletes and there is an insufficiency fracture where the bone is diseased uh, and just a trivial trauma causes a fracture which will be seen in the osteoporotic fracture osteoporotic bones and there are traumatic fractures which are because high energy which are due to the high energy trauma coming to the coccyx again coccyx again it's uh, derived from a greek word coccyx which means uh, cuckoo or because the shape of the coccyx is like a beak beak of the cuckoo it's called as coccyx again the coccyx it has a ossification it has only one ossification center for the body so it appears by the by the uh, first year and uh, subsequently the other segments ossification centers start appearing and the fusion starts by the end of sec by the end of second decade and is completed at the end of the second decade now this is a picture showing the anterior and the posterior surface of the coccyx if you look at the first segment of the coccyx it has a body here the blue is the transverse process of the first segment the green is the articular surface which articulates with the sacrum s5 segment forming the sacrococcygeal joint and the yellow is the cornu of the coccyx which articulates with the cornu of the sacrum that forms the sacral foramina for exiting of the L, uh, of the s5 nerve root the remaining three coccyx segments they have a body and the remnants of the transverse process again the articulations wise it forms the sacrococcygeal symphysis of the joint which is fibrocartilaginous joint and the sacral foramen which is formed again by by the uh, by the fusion of the or the articulation of the cornu of uh, coccyx and the sacrum ligament wise there are ligaments anterior sacrococcygeal ligament posterior sacrococcygeal ligament which has a two layers superficial and deep and the lateral coccygeal ligaments coming to the muscle attachment again coccyx it gives attachment to three important muscles the levator ani which are, which is attached at the center of the coccyx on the ventral surface or the ventral and uh, antero uh, lateral is attached the coccygeus and on the dorsal surface is the gluteus maximus few fibers of the gluteus maximus this coccygeus and the levator ani they form the uh, muscles of the pelvic floor uh, which helps in supporting the pelvic organs 
again, the blood supply, the lymphatic system is similar to the sacrum uh, from the medium sacral art artery and vein and the lateral sacral artery and vein. The nerve supply uh, for the coccyx is through the uh, coccygeal plexus, which is formed by the S4, S5, and the coccygeal nerves, along with the dorsal rim of the sacral sympathetic trunk. Movement-wise, if you take a coccyx, coccyx, uh, mainly uh, the movement occurs at the sacrococcygeal joint. It's mainly during the sitting and the standing position. And uh, also during labor, basically the coccyx moves uh, posteriorly so that the space available for the passage of the baby is enlarged. And for post-labor, uh, post, uh, again, the uh, coccyx is brought back into the uh, position by as it moves anteriorly. Function-wise, as we know, it gives attachment to uh, the important structures, the, mainly the muscles, the levator ani, and the muscles of the pelvic floor, which support the important structures and the anal sphincter. Final terminal, again, it's an extension of the pia mater from the lower part of the conus medullaris and goes and attaches to the coccyx. Coming to the sacral and the coccyx classification, fracture classification, there were uh, different classifications. Like uh, first, I mean, it was the Roy Camelli classification, which described only the, uh, only uh, the, uh, the, uh, described about the trans uh, included only the transverse fractures of the sacrum, the coccyx. Then uh, it was the Eiler and the Gans, which uh, took into consideration the L5S1 joint and uh, versus the uh, the spinal pelvic stability. And the more common uh, the more com uh, common that uh, common uh, classification that we use is the Dennis, where it, it uh, the Dennis described the three zones. The zone one, which is lateral on the sacral ali, the zone two along the neur uh, neural foramen, and the zone three in the center of the sacrum. The Caro et al., I mean, they clubbed all the horizontal and the vertical fractures into group. But these, the the problem with this classification system was uh, that they did not cover the entire spectrum. There was a low inter and intra observer reliability, and they could not anticipate the prognosis. So that is where the AU classification was brought in, which is CT based. And this helps in communication with one another. It serves as a common language for uh, all the surgeons across the world. It also helps in defining the prognosis after the injury or treatment and describes 10 patterns. Now AO classification, it, has, it uh, takes into consideration three criteria, uh, basically the morphology, Second one is the case specific modifiers, and third is the neurological injury, as we seen in the thoracolumbar fracture, uh, fracture classification and the cervical subaxial uh, fracture classifications. Morphology wise, the type A is the lower sacrococcygeal fractures, type B are the posterior pelvic, and type C are the spinal pelvic. This, this is a picture that shows, uh, explains the classification system where type a is the lower sacrococcygeal injuries, which means the fracture line is below the sacroiliac joint. So this is further divided into A1, A2, and A3. So A1 are the coccygeal or the sacral compression fractures or the ligamentous avulsion fractures. A2, these are the non-displaced transverse fractures below again below the sacroiliac joint. And A3, these are displaced transverse fractures below the sacroiliac joint. When we, when we look at the type B fractures, these are the posterior pelvic injuries. That means the fracture line is lateral to the L5-S1 facet joint so that it doesn't cause any spinal, uh, it doesn't include the spinal pelvic instability fractures. So B1 is a fracture which is lateral to the L5-S1 facet but just medial to the neural foramen. These are unilateral vertical fractures. And again, B2 is a transalar fracture, again a vertical fracture, but which is lateral to the neural foramen. And then there is B3, which is through the neural foramen. Now these, these are the, the B type fractures, they remind us about the Dennis fracture classification, which are described uh, zone one, 
which is similar to B2, zone 2, which is similar to B3, and zone 3, which is similar to B1. When the fracture is and in the zone B2, that is the transailer, the chances of neurological injury are only 5%. Here, mainly the L5 nerve root gets injured. The, it's because of the displacement of the sacral ali and the nerve root gets trapped between the sacral ali and the L5 transverse process. When it comes to B3, that is the transforaminal, the chances of neurological injury are around 25%, 25 to 28%. And when it comes to B1, the chances of neurological injury are around 68%. Coming to the type C, which describes the spinopelvic injuries. Now, the difference between type B and type C is the fracture line is just medial to the L5S1 joint. That is, there is a disruption of the L5S1 joint. And that is why these fractures are included in the type C, which cause spinopelvic instability. Now, there is a C0, which is non-displaced sacral U-type fracture. Now, this fracture is included. These are basically the uh, in, uh, in uh, sufficiency fractures, which occur due to the osteoporosis. The C1, it's again, these are B-type fractures. C1 is again B-type fractures. That is, these are vertical fractures, but the fracture line is again medial to the L5S1 joint. So this causes the spinopelvic instability. C2 is bilateral vertical fractures, which cause again cause spinopelvic instability. And C3, these are displaced U-type sac sacral fractures maybe U-type or H-type, which again cause spinopelvic injuries. Now, there are uh, patient-specific uh, modifiers, uh, which are included in this classification, where M1 is the substantial soft tissue injury. M2, it's mainly the metabolic bone disease. M3 is the anterior pelvic ring injury. And M4 is the sacroiliac joint injury. These are associated injuries along with the sacral fractures. Then there is a neurological component that is included here. N0 is the intact neurological status of the patient. N1 is transient injury. N2 is a non-transient nerve root injury, which usually involves the L5 and the S1 nerve root. And N3, it includes the cord equina injury. Now, again, when this classification, what are the drawbacks or the limitations of this classification are? The inter-observer reliability for the classification of the fracture type A, type B, type C, it was substantial. Now, this is based on the kappa values, where uh, if the kappa value is around uh, 0.6 to 0.8, it's substantial. More than 0.8 is almost perfect. So the intra-observer reliability was almost perfect. But when it came to the subtype of the fractures, the A1, A2, uh, A3, or the B2, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, the inter-observer reliability, it was moderate. That, that is, it was less than 0.6. And the inter-observer observer reliability was around, uh, is, it was almost as substantial, that is 0.8. So uh, since the inter and the inter-observer reliability, was, it's not very reliable. So the when, when the subtypes were taken into consideration, it became difficult to uh, understand these fractures and uh, manage it, uh, uh, plan a treatment protocol for these uh, patients. Now, another thing was the modifiers which we uh, discussed and the neurological injury. Again, it was not subjected to reliability. Again, this AO classification, it did, did not describe the degree or the displacement angulation of the fracture. And also, if you look at type C, the C0, C0, which is an insufficiency fracture, which occurs mostly due to the osteoporosis of the bone, was included in the type C fracture. Now, if you look, type B is a severe, more severe injury. Type B1 or B2 is a more severe injury than type C0. But still, type C0 has been included in the type C classification. So that was another limit uh, drawback of this classification. And again, if the if there are the, the lower frequency of some fracture patterns were observed, for example, when the Vaccaro et al., I mean, the, they did a study, they found that uh, most of their fracture, I mean, the, the, the A1 type fractures, 
uh, the number of A1 type fractures that they uh, got in the study were less. And this affected the inter-observer and the intra-observer reliability. So these were the drawbacks and limitations of these classifications. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, for this uh, nice presentation and nice uh, clarification of the classification system of the sacral fractures. Uh, we'll see if uh, there is anyone have any questions in the chat or if uh, anyone can ask directly, Dr. Emmanuel. I don't see any questions. Dr. Manuel, uh, conduct your, your experience. How uh, many cases do you uh, face uh, like this in the real world? Uh, do you yeah, the usually usually fractures were very less common, but most of the fractures which were which were undisplaced were managed uh, non-operatively. We hardly get, I mean, uh, sacral and coccyx fractures in our practice. It's more, mostly the thoracolumbar region and the cervical spine injuries where we get the dislocations and the burst and other fractures. Sacral fractures are not very common here, at least in our practice. When we have a sacral fracture, usually you do it or uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons do it? Uh, actually, I'm an orthopedic uh, surgeon, orthopedic spine surgeon. Uh, yeah. oh. uh, I do have a, okay, I do have a, we, uh, I'm working, but I'm working in the neurosurgery department. So we do have neurosurgeons around. So uh, as a team, we work together and uh, make a plan for these fractures. But mostly, I mean, our... Go on, continue, doctor. Yeah, that, that's it. Most of, but most of our patients, most of the fractures that we get here are mainly the thoracolumbar regions and the cervical trauma. In our practice, usually uh, they are uh, different departments. Uh, neurosurgery are different from orthopedic uh, department, and usually sacral uh, fractures are usually managed by orthopedic uh, surgeons, not by us. We usually okay. take care more of the thoracolumbar and cervical, as you said. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, doctor. I see there is no uh, questions. If anyone want to ask any questions, okay. thank you. It uh, looks like there is one question here by Dr. Muhammad Awad. Uh, does venous formation at C2 in patient with Down syndrome lead to instability? This is not related to our subject. But, uh, if you would like to answer. Sorry, I didn't get you. He's asking about C2 uh, venous formation in uh, Down syndrome. Uh, this is uh, unrelated to our subject today. So I yeah, the think, C2, uh, I think that the, because of the panus, panus basically it causes uh, erosion and uh, erosion of the uh, bone, and uh, because of the uh, and uh, on top of that, if there is a Down syndrome there'll be ligamentous lax uh, laxity, which results in the instability of the C1 and C2 joint. So it, it does uh, cause erosion of the bone and uh, instability. Thank you. So I think there is no more questions. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, for your uh, Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you so uh, much. thank you for your support. And the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome, Dr. And uh, we are thank you to you. Thanks to you. Uh, so by this, we conclude uh, our last webinar of the comprehensive neuroeducation course. Uh, we should have uh, another uh, presentation by Dr. Victor Hugo Beric, but unfortunately he was not available and he could not uh, join us. So maybe we can do it in another webinar. Uh, so for all the participants, all those who uh, fulfill the minimum requirements, of attendance will be given a certificate of attendance in the this few uh, days, one week in maximum. And uh, where I take this opportunity also to invite you all to attend the sixth Feminine Neurosurgical Conference that will be held in November 27th until 29th. Uh, the announcement will be sent uh, in WhatsApp to the groups and uh, also the registration and Zoom registration also will be sent. So thank you all for attendance and thanks to all speakers. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. And thanks to, to the Professor Salman Sharif also. And uh, to all speakers who 
assist in the success of this uh, comprehensive educational course. So, really thank you, Doctor, and thanks to all attendants. Thank you very much.